So if this is accurate, it doesn't matter what you do here. So any treatment that you focus on this is, has no effect. And this has been shown now. And that's why it's now so important that KRS testing is being performed and patients are being uh, treated for things. Colorectal cancer. Interestingly, and that's why I think it's so interesting for us pathologists, it's not the case in head and neck cancer, where the pathway is not a pathway. And it's also not the case in lung cancer. Both are being treated with EGFR blocking, but the pathways are different than the molecular testing too. Okay, rest testing is relatively simple for molecular biologists. They know sort of which colons to sequence, which colon the mutations are important. However, there was a very interesting observation in the United States a few years ago. We know that about 40% of colorectal cancers should have a KRS mutation, and it was the biggest, one of the bigger uh, molecular commercial uh, molecular laboratories in the United States had only 20%. So one thought there must be something wrong. And it took months of looking into that by molecular biologists, other people who knew quality assurance. They could not find any mistake unless, of course, a pathologist came. Because a pathologist is a person who can make diagnosis. Um, and it took only a few minutes before the pathologist realized what was wrong. Uh, those who haven't heard the story, what, what do you think that could be wrong in a lab that does perfect molecular testing that has too few positive results? Any idea? You are all pathologists? Wrong sample. Wrong sample, exactly. Uh, we know that as pathologists, what this lab was doing, they asked for tissue from patients with colorectal cancer. They didn't ask for cancer tissue from colorectal cancer patients. And if you don't understand that you need cancer cells to do your test, you just do the negative lymph nodes because they're plenty of those. Well, this is of course just an example, but there are more examples like that where it's so important that we as pathologists are very close to that. And I think nowadays every pathologist is involved or should be involved in uh, this type of work. I don't think every pathologist has to do the testing him or herself, but has to understand what's going on. In 2008, the, uh, uh, <coughs> this, this became known that this was important, and the European Society of Pathologists decided to start a quality assurance program. As you probably know, I don't know the situation in Serbia, but in the Netherlands, we know that about 85% of the test for the two testing is correct. Uh, this is still accepted. Uh, but I felt, uh, not being a breast pathologist, that the correct answer would have to be better. We have to be above 95%. And therefore, we decided to do a certain quality assurance from the beginning on. This, this went pretty fast. Uh, in uh, uh, 2008, February, uh, we had uh, the, the knowledge came about that KRS testing was important. And, uh, it was published uh, how to do that in 2008, and in 2009 we had the first results of quality assurance testing. This is, don't read the science, but look at the yellow box. These are the different laboratories, these are the different samples, and the yellow boxes are the mistakes. Now these were the first experienced laboratories were published from KRS testing and were considered to be the expert laboratories. And as you can see, several mistakes are done and few laboratories are even below the level. So it doesn't mean that if you publish about something that you're a very good laboratory. You have to show it. These are the extraction methods and the methods being used for mutation mutation. It's all over the place. Different ways of doing it. There is no standardization at all. And that's still not the case. And we don't know which method is the best. One of the reasons to do this in all Europe is to see, is to find out which method is going to be the best. So I think the role of pathologists is crucial in this whole uh, program, uh, especially in the selection of the proper tissue to use. And also to take care that the, that the way of fixation and tissue processing is done so that the DNA is fine. This is the results from some countries. Uh, what we see now, we have done more than 250 laboratories, that about 85 to 90 percent of the laboratories are immediately at all samples correct. But what we also have seen that the ones that did not perform well after feedback did perform well the second time. So this shows that it's feasible in many laboratories, uh, but if you but that you have to listen to the feedback. Uh, 
this is a bit shocking to me. This was shocking to me. What you see here is uh, an important part in, in molecular testing is you have an estimate about the tumor content of the sample. <coughs> These are all the samples. And each, each line is one sample. And this is the lowest estimate. And this is the highest estimate of a group of six pathologies. So the same sample was considered to have, let's say, what is it, 35% of tumor cells, and another pathology said it's 90% of tumor cells. I, 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 I found this very short. Um, and we are now working on to see why. A few easy solutions were that some pathologists use the surface area. The surface area as the amount of tumor. But of course we're dealing with DNA. So you have to count or estimate the number of cells. So if you have a lot of inflammatory cells, for instance, lymph follicles surrounding your tumor, the percentage goes down enormously, even though the surface is not The other interesting thing was that some pathologists gave the estimate of the whole slide, whereas only part of the slide was used for the DNA analysis. Of course, that's a very simple uh, mistake, because the molecular biologist needs to know what's in the sample. And we have now created a website uh, and try to find out with <coughs> guidelines if you can use that because I was really sh I'm still shocked by it when I showed this slide. Percentage of tumor cells in the center. Another topic, reporting. There is a standard uh, way of reporting molecular results <coughs> and that has, it doesn't matter so much what's standing here, but you can see that the items that need to be in the report are not in all the reports. Some items are only in 25% <coughs> so we do need to perform better in our reporting of this Well, uh, you'll see what happens. Uh, two presidents, one that yes we can, uh, you'll see if you can, well, can, if you can do it again. Uh, the other one who said yes you must, that's not the way to go because. <laughs> but I think we have pathologists we can. Now that you revolutionizing it is. Uh, in 2011, only a year ago, the first tumor was fully sequenced. The results were amazing. We thought that it needed about six to eight steps from a normal cell to a tumor cell. The, tumor cell, the tumors that have now been sequenced, the lowest number of mistakes found is the third. The tumor cells are way more complicated. And you have probably read a few months ago a paper in the New England Journal, uh, which, uh, and I found that sort of amusing, because the paper was in the New England Journal, you know, it's, it's the most famous journal we have, and the, the paper showed that tumors are heterogeneous. Heterogeneous, heterogeneous, so there's heterogeneity within tumors. I think if I had asked you a year ago this question, you all would have said, of course tumors are heterogeneous. You have evasive front and you have that. Now this is news for the medical society because now it's also based on genetics. Um, and of course about a lot of pathologists in the world. But also what it does, and this is a very nice example, and I can do that to the data. The cost of sequencing used to be very high. And it was predicted, and I talked about prediction and how difficult it is, where prediction are about the costs. But they go even faster to a lower price than, than so, what do you think that whole genome sequence, if, if you want to have your whole genome sequence, how much would you pay? If, if you come to my laboratory uh, and you want your whole genome sequence, how much do you think it costs? Any idea? In euros, please, because I don't know the genome sequence. No, the whole genome. The whole genome. Whole genome. Whole genome. 45,000. 45,000. <laughs> so this is it now, 1,000. And next year it will probably be 500. <coughs> understand? Please understand what this means. For, for clinical geneticists, we have a lot of clinical geneticists in my, my, my hospital. They, have lost it. they are losing their job. What they used to do when a baby was born, this abnormal face or strange ears or whatever, they look very carefully and say, maybe this is Newton syndrome, or maybe this is that syndrome. They don't go to that 
They give the DNA, and then in, in two weeks they get the answer. They have now learned that most of those uh, mental validations that we see are new mistakes. They are not from the part of the model, it's new. And in my uh, genetics department, this one floor above mine, they have uh, a, a scheme on all the new diseases and the genes involved that they discovered. They discovered now one group. It's an amazing change. They have discovered more than 500 new diseases within three years' time. Diseases coupled to a genetic change. So this is what's happening now. A tumor coupled to genetics is a whole different story. Tumor genetics is complicated, it's difficult. Um, and uh, we as pathologists need to be involved in that. Just a nice example. Uh, this was also published in the New England Journal of Medicine a year ago. And they showed that there are the reputation errors of chemo. And if you like to use that as a, a marker, it, it's fine. It's the best we have for all the obvious and morphology. And so. I hope you can see that. So what, what, they, what they did, they had just a case where there was done a mistake. They ordered the wrong test. They ordered the rep where they wanted to do something else. And they found a mutation. This was one case of errors. They went back to their freezer or to their archive, I don't know, I don't remember this project issue. Checked all the hair cells they had, collected a few colleagues, and in total they had 100 cases, all 100 cases had a mutation. They checked CLL, follicular uh, lymphoma, and within three months they came from a coincidental discovery to a new marker of the disease. Uh, so this is the same story as I told you about mental cell lymphoma. It took us 10 years, now it takes three months. I won't go too much into it. And this is another complete revolution. Uh, at our national meeting, uh, one of the uh, uh, pulmonary pathologists uh, who came from the United States, they were <coughs> working on new classifications, on morphology, etc. And he told us, you know, I thought that lung cancer was a disease. And he came to learn the last couple of months, years, that it's not. These are now driver mutations in pulmonary adenomatic. And all these driver mutations are mutually exclusive. So this is the new classification of lung cancer. And it's important because for all, almost all of them, there are drugs. So we now routinely report whether there is an ELK fusion, whether there is a 2 amplification, whether there is EGFR um, uh, amplification, uh, mutations, or KRS mutations. We have to do that for all our lung cancer patients now. And a half year ago we didn't. And that's not so easy because it's not a lot of material. This is for those patients you don't do surgery on. These are for the metastasized patients, so we have small biopsies only cells sometimes. And the clinician wants to know this information because it's immediately, this has this patient treatment. Because if you don't treat it fast, the patient has died, you know, and the cancer still has a better prognosis. So for pulmonary pathologists, the world now is completely different. This is, this was not in my slide in Helsinki. Uh, that was in September last year. It was not known. Nothing of this was known. Now it is. That is, that fast is happening. And we 